Thank you very much. Um, and like uh, many of the talks probably going to see today, this is not just my work. There's all these lovely people, plus a few more who've contributed various little bits. In this. Yeah, so there's various people who've contributed um, different bits to the project um, and uh, more besides these ones listed here. Um, so, uh, yeah, before we get going, there's just a bit of licensing information and the slides, uh, I've got them online, there's a quick QR code there, but I think they've also been linked from the Oxford Abstracts as well, if you want to pick them up and follow along, and if you want to follow any of the links later on. Um, so there's a little sort of introduction to what we're doing. Uh, I work at the ICCS, which is the Institute of Computing for Climate Science, which is a domain-specific RSE group um, in Cambridge. And this is specifically within the climate sciences. Um, so the idea is that it brings sort of people with varying uh, expertise together. And one of the advantages is that by being involved in lots of projects within a specific domain, you begin to see sort of what some of the common challenges and problems are um, and how to address them. And that's really sort of how some of this work that I'm talking about today uh, came about. Um, I won't go into too much detail because I believe there's a wonderful poster upstairs that you can go and look at. Um, so within climate modeling, um, for those who sort of don't have the background, often the way these very, very large models of the atmosphere, ocean, planet are structured is you have uh, sort of some kind of dynamical core, um, which will do kind of your fluid motions. So it will look after the uh, motion of the air, the motion of the atmosphere, carrying heat, pressure, whatever else. Um, but surrounding that, you have lots of kind of sub modules or sub programs, whatever you want to call them, that each look after doing some other bit of the physics. So we might have something that controls, say, our microphysics, telling us um, what water turns into vapor versus turns into ice, turns into snow, uh, something that controls radiation, so heat from the sun coming down, going back up. How does this influence? And what often happens is sort of the relevant variables will be passed out of the dynamic core um, to some subroutine where uh, operations are performed, and then they're sent back. And this is the way a lot of these models are working in a very broad overview sense. Um, so when we think about machine learning, often we think of it sort of particularly deep learning as very much an end-to-end -end process. We have some very clearly defined input. We give our model, it takes that and it spits out some kind of array at the end. Maybe we, we run kind of a, a function over it to decide what the correct output is. And we can say, okay, this number is telling us what this item is. Um, whereas what we find a lot of the groups we're working with are trying to do is actually not do an entire end-to-end -end process, um, though there are some people trying that, but it's actually replacing just one small component of this much, much larger, um, much more complex model. Um, and that brings with it, with all your kind of traditional machine learning challenges, also a few extra ones that um, we spotted. So when groups are trying to do this, when they're trying to replace one particular little component, there's often two things they're trying to do. Either they're trying to emulate an existing physics-based scheme, so learn from that existing scheme, if we can take what's sort of very, very heavy, um, intensive computation in, uh, say, radiation or convection, if we can code that up into a neural net and run it much, much faster, then we get we can run longer forecasts, uh, more high-fidelity forecasts, more ensembles. Uh, the other approach that some of the people working with is looking at data-driven. So obviously all physical models are uh, imperfect, but if you can sort of learn from real world data rather than a physics-based model, perhaps you can capture additional behavior. So there's sort of two ways you might want to put neural nets into your, into your much larger codes. However, this brings with it um, sort of a few challenges. One is uh, physical compatibility, uh, which I won't talk about here, but we are uh, thinking about which is the fact that a lot of these physics-based models have uh, sort of conservation laws or physical laws built in. Say, if we're talking about precipitation, we can't have negative rain, but it's very difficult to tell that to your neural net. Um, and there's a problem that you might have a very stable offline model, but when you put it online, as these sort of variables feed back into the much larger model, um, any discrepancies can cause instability. So that's an important thing. Um, the second problem that often comes with this is one of language interoperation. So traditionally, machine learning <laughs> will be written in some kind of Python framework, um, <clears throat> which is your uh, favorite, uh, favorite framework, and why is it PyTorch? Um, 
But a lot of these really, really big models we've got, uh, for very good reasons, not just legacy, but also because they're requiring lots of array operations running on HPC, many, many of these models are written in Fortran, and they've been being developed for decades now. Um, so they're very, very complex. Um, but there's very little sort of machine learning infrastructure. So before we sort of talk about solutions, I think there's there's two things to consider here. There's computational efficiency, which uh, anyone in HPC is familiar with, sort of how fast can it run, how low memory can it use. use. But I think as RSEs, we can also talk about the developer uh, efficiency. So here, a lot of this work is still kind of in the early stages. Um, it's great if you have something that shaves 20 seconds off a, off a simulation runtime, but if it takes a scientist sort of three months of reading web pages, 20 hours of coding to do something that could be done taking 20 seconds longer, but written up in an afternoon, which one's really more efficient? Um, and so, so I think I, I would propose that the ideal solution for doing this coupling shouldn't really generate any excess additional work more than it needs to. There's obviously going to be a little bit. But importantly, it shouldn't require you to know sort of advanced computing skills. Um, there should be a minimal learning curve to it so that uh, anyone can sort of start accessing and doing the science. Um, we want to reduce dependencies. That's always good. Um, we want something that's easy to maintain, sort of following principles of fair research. Um, and yeah, we still want to maximize the performance where we can um, computationally. So, so there's a few options. Um, these that we've come across and sort of the groups that we've been working with within the ICCS sort of came to us um, from lots of different backgrounds trying things. Um, so the, the one that sort of looks most appealing to a lot of scientists, especially those who sort of are new to the machine learning and uh, come from the kind of traditional modeling is to implement your neural net in Fortran. Um, and there are a couple of libraries trying to do this, but they're very early and they're kind of reinventing the wheel, um, which yeah. Um, the advantages of this is it does remove the two language problem. Um, everything's in Fortran, uh, smack it through your make file, away we go. Uh, the problem with this is, yeah, A, you're reinventing the wheel. B, if you've developed your model in Python, how do you ensure you port it correctly? Even if you've moved the weights into the right places, how do you make sure the data structure is the same? How do you make sure it's giving you exactly the same numbers that it's been trained to do? Um, secondly, PyTorch, TensorFlow, these have been highly optimized, probably more so than anything you're going to write. And if you're just doing uh, matrix multiplications with ReLU layers, great. Probably not too hard. Once you start trying to leverage a lot of the more complex packages, so say some of the radiation schemes I talked about earlier are using recurrent neural networks, suddenly trying to write this in Fortran is going to get a bit more challenging. Uh, so another approach we've seen quite a few people use is 4Py or the CFFI. Um, so 4Py is uh, a little module. It's it's just, well, it's a big file, but you it's one file. You drop it in with your Fortran code, and it brings Python data types into Fortran. Um, so this is nice. It's very easy to add. You just drop that one file in. Um, the problems are it's quite verbose, and there's quite a large learning curve because you're kind of trying to smack Python into Fortran and make it work. Um, and it increases your dependencies because you've got to manage and link a for uh, a Python environment to your sort of HPC code, which we'll come back to in a moment. Uh, another approach is smart and pipes. So here, this is where you take sort of you take your data from Fortran, you pass it out through some kind of network layer. Uh, smart sim uses the Redis API, um, and you pass it into uh, some Python that sat somewhere else. Do all your machine learning calculations, pass it back through the network layer, back into your Fortran, and away you go. Um, now, I think uh, this isn't uh, necessarily a bad option. And indeed, there are a few architectures of uh, HPCs where this might be necessary, depending on sort of the ratio of GPUs to um, CPUs or GPUs to nodes, or if you've got kind of um, GPUs on board with your HPC or whether they're elsewhere. Um, sometimes it's going to be impossible to avoid the data copying. However, there's a quite steep learning curve. You've got to learn all the API commands. You've got to learn the Redis. You've got to outfit your code with these. Um, and if we don't need it, it involves data copying, which is going to be very expensive when we're going to take a performance hit. Uh, the final one is the Fortran Keras bridge. Uh, so this is, again, written in pure Fortran. Uh, however, it's TensorFlow only. 
and it's fairly incomplete and looking at the GitHub repositories, it's been fairly inactive for a while now. Um, so we're hesitant to sort of advise people going down this route. Um, so a lot of these traditionally, what you're saying is you have your Fortran, you've got to pass some data somewhere through the Python runtime. This has got to be linked somewhere to a Python environment. It goes down to your machine learning, comes back up, goes into the Fortran. And I think Randall Monroe, um, obviously there's a XKCD in here, but sums up fairly well why we probably don't want this uh, on a HPC. Um, it's, it's just going to be a nightmare trying to manage this. Um, have you loaded the right Python? Have you booted up a virtual environment? Did you do it on the home node? Is it on a compute node? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what we're instead proposing is to cut all this out entirely. Um, so we're going to go straight from the Fortran to the machine learning, no Python at all. Um, sorry if I clickbaited you with the talk title. Um, so, so what we've done is uh, develop a couple of interfacing libraries. So, so key to this is the fact that both PyTorch and TensorFlow, uh, they're not Python uh, frameworks. They're actually C++ backends, and they have APIs in Python, which is what everyone uses. Um, and binding into C um, is sort of quite well supported from using the ISO C binding module. And once we've got into C, we can get into C++. Um, so for PyTorch, we uh, go into the C++ API. And the way we actually sort of very, very long story short is from Python, you archive your model as Torch script, which is this kind of statically typed subset of Python that can be then read by uh, the Torch C++ libraries. Um, and we uh, wrap around those calls to read that Torch script in and run it uh, and return data. Um, TensorFlow has both C and C++ API, so we go from C1, um, just because it's a bit easier, there's only one step to get there. Um, again, you sort of have to save your model in this uh, specific format, the Keras save model. Um, TensorFlow was a bit more work for us. Uh, we had to develop this kind of process model module because the interface or the API sort of expects to know some parameters about your model before you call it. So you have to kind of go through and extract these. It's a bit hard work. Generally, we sort of, we found the PyTorch route much, much easier. Um, so if, you, if you're thinking about one or two, PyTorch, I think is definitely the better one. Um, in terms of performance, uh, the sort of the computational performance, one of the things we do is utilize no copy access in memory. So uh, when we write out of the Fortran, we uh, write our arrays. So sort of these are the Fortran arrays in memory. As long as they're the right uh, data format, these can be read straight by the uh, machine learning uh, without actually having to kind of do any transforms or pass anything. This is nice because uh, sort of one of the things that is always going to come up is uh, the column major, row major. But actually, by doing this shared access memory, you can also sidestep that issue or sort of hide it away from the user who's more likely to sort of get in a model with it. I mean, it still puts a lot of us in a model. Um, you can hide that, that away, abstract that away using kind of data accessors um, to do strided access to the data in Python. Um, I think the more important one to talk about is the ease of use. So our installation process is, we've tried to make it very smooth for users. Um, it's all largely done by CMake. Um, you need to obtain uh, the sort of the underlying torch or, um, C++ uh, Torch or TensorFlow libraries. This can be done from their websites. They do provide binaries. But if you've got someone who even might find that a bit challenging, you can just do it by getting a Python then and it'll dump all the files on your system. And we do provide instructions how you can link to the files that have been downloaded if you need to. Um, yeah, it's then just a case of cloning, building. We've got uh, Intel and GCC running. Um, then you install it and link it like you would uh, any other library that's going into your code. Um, we also provide some tooling with this. So our PyTorch to Torch script script um, sort of takes users through with handy insert your code here for taking their PyTorch models that they've been developing and dumping them out as a PyTorch file, uh, Torch script file that can then be converted. And I already mentioned the process model um, module that we've got for TensorFlow. Um, and finally, uh, there could always be more, but we're putting in some examples in there that sort of take users, hold their hand all the way through from here is some PyTorch code with a machine learning model. Uh, what are all the things you need to do to actually put it into a Fortran program and run it there? 
Um, and these are both kind of some user-defined models, so they can see how they might write it. But we also you have some examples with sort of preloaded models like ResNet 18. Um, finally, the support we've got. So uh, I think one key thing uh, is that we're using these frameworks implementations directly. We're not writing our own machine learning. So in theory, as new features come along into these libraries, as long as we can write the correct API calls to them um, in, our, in our libraries, um, everything should be uh, supported going forward. Um, and we've got kind of this direct translation of the PyTorch or TensorFlow models you were using. So you can be confident that what you've trained is what you're running. Um, we're licensing under MIT, um, and these are available on GitHub as uh, FOSS software. Um, MIT is sort of highly permissible. It means that uh, anyone can use it, but also they don't need to worry about what restrictions there might be, whereas some of the uh, other libraries we've seen are uh, under GPL, which might be a deterrent, unfortunately, for some people. Um, so as a quick case study, uh, one of our uh, project partners wanted to replace one of their parameterizations, gravity waves in this case, in their atmospheric model. Um, so they had a net that they're trained. It was emulating a paper, uh, so emulating an existing scheme, um, and they were finding it was very, very slow uh, when they were running it, uh, sort of prohibitively so. Uh, so uh, what we did is we replaced uh, sort of the net they're connected with 4Py using our direct coupled approach, and we did both uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch um, sort of to get a comparison. Um, the key thing that sort of came out of this, I think, was um, given a Fortran program that's got some uh, data in arrays, uh, the boilerplate that they needed to couple and run this with 4Py was sort of 67 lines. Um, we managed to get it down to 39. And sort of more, more importantly, it's a lot more intuitive. So there's a very obviously cherry-picked example. This is how they were previously loading a torch model. Like I say, it's, it's a pain because you're trying to smack together Python types inside Fortran. Writing this library in an API, you can get it much shorter, but also much more intuitive. All you need to do is give it the location you've saved the model and you load the model. Um, so it's much more familiar to those who are coming from the Python background. Um, so our takeaway messages, I guess, is that machine learning has a lot of applications. My background's in geoscience, but there's a lot of um, very uh, heavy scientific computing that's using um, Fortran models that are now wanting to look at leveraging machine learning across um, a range of domains, chemistry, plasma. Many of you probably know more. Um, we know that doing it sort of effectively, you need to be careful. Um, but we've got these libraries now to, uh, to help scientists make progress with this. Um, and we definitely find both coupling with our libraries, but also developing the libraries was much easier with PyTorch. Um, so we have a preference for that. Um, so this is good. We've worked with a couple of projects. We've got some future work now. Um, we want to get this out as sort of a proper, fully fledged uh, open source project, which involves releases, um, putting some stuff on Justin Zenodo. Um, the GPU sort of offload, offloading functionalities should be there because they're within the PyTorch libraries, the TensorFlow libraries, but we've not done extensive testing on that yet. So it's something that, that we need to look into. Um, and then looking at further functionalities. At the moment, we've just an inference because that's what a lot of our project partners needed. But as I said earlier, online training is likely to become very important, especially when you want to avoid stability issues within your models. Um, and finally, um, if you've sort of seen anything that might be interesting, please do pass this on to other users. We want this to become sort of a bigger open source project. Um, we're keen to have other people contributing. Um, and we want developers, testers feedback. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, the libraries are online there. Um, and do you have any questions? Right. So the first question that we have is, um, how does the use of AI for climate interact with existing climate models? Do you know? So, so there's, a, there's a few approaches. There's a lot of um, different things people are doing within climate. There's sort of people who look at completely different stuff, downscaling, upscaling data. Um, there are, as Gail alluded to in the talk this morning, sort of people who are looking at doing entire forecasts within um, machine learning. The stuff that we're looking at is, like I said at the start, kind of 
just replacing individual components of models at the moment. Um, and there's um, it, a lot of them, the emulations run fairly well. Um, I think one of the problems with science is that I have seen a few results at conferences where some of the aforementioned problems with training your models offline, putting them back in, and what looked like a well-performing stable model offline generates sort of waves. And, and you see them sort of as numerical waves in a physical system moving through once you put it back online. The pain is that these are not good results, so they're very difficult to actually find in literature. Um, but but I think that's one of the key challenges with the interaction. I think that's what the question was asking. I'm not 100%. It's a very broad question, <laughs> but um, you did a good job of covering a lot of different points. Um, moving on to the next one um, from Sherman Lowe. What's the difference between multi-target ML models and coupled ML models? Uh, what do you mean by multi-target? Well, multi-target meaning by in like university output, you can have loads of inputs like the thing, the models and outputs, a single number. But in the time it's not even like all the system numbers, but then uh multi target would be so one number is right, yes, yeah. Oh. Yeah, okay. So so models that output more than just one number, more than its Pikachu. Um so I don't think there's there's too much difference here. Um basically the a lot of the researchers we work with, um, their codes output arrays. So they might take in an array of gridded data for temperature, pressure, velocity, and the output data is um, a grid on the same domain um, of wave drag or um, tendency for temperature change, um, which does bring into one of the other challenges with machine learning is that a lot of these models are fixed on your grid. So if you want to train a model on um, sort of a regional grid of the UK, you can't just take that model and then deploy it to some other grid over the world uh, at a different scale. Thank you. Um, next question. There's a suggestion of, have you considered using Mojo to run some performance comparison with your framework? Uh, I don't know what Mojo is, but I'd be keen to hear about it um, from whoever does know it. Um, we have been looking at uh, a few different frameworks that are out there, a few of the ones I mentioned at the start. We would like to do some more detailed comparisons with Smart Sim, um, but we've yeah not looked at Mojo, yeah. but please let me know. No, nice, nice suggestion. <clears throat> um, and then we've got time for one more. Is there any improvement for subscale physics that are currently parameterized, i.e. rain droplet formation? Yes, so lots. This is this is what a lot of people are, are working on. What a lot of people are chasing at the moment is um, trying to improve this. And this, I think, comes into uh, that second approach, which is the data-driven parameterizations, where rather than training on your existing physical model, can you take real-world data and actually sort of in your big mystery black box encode more than we are currently capturing with our physics-based models. Um, but yeah, subgrid subgrid is where this is kind of very active at the moment in geoscience. Okay, I think that's all the questions for now. Very exciting talk. Thank you again, Jack. Thank you.